Sandro Botticelli was possibly the most famous of the painters the Medici patronized. I mean, it kind of comes down to him, Fra Filippo Lippi, Donatello, Michelangelo, but arguments can be made either way. And he's generally considered a master of line, although he was also a brilliant colorist. We're going to be looking at a couple of his pieces, the first being the Primavera. Now, the Primavera is a huge canvas, as you can see, and its precise meaning has eluded scholars for some time. The problem is we don't really agree on it. It was created for one of Lorenzo Medici's cousins, possibly as a wedding gift, which could give it a great deal of context, and that's the direction I'm going to follow as I interpret the work. Now, the work features a frieze-like arrangement of figures in front of a curtain of orange trees in honor of the patron, oranges symbolizing the Medici. The symbol for the Medici is actually gold coins, but oranges, of course, look a lot like gold coins, especially in a painting. The goddess here stands with an opening in the trees behind her, revealing a kind of halo. Now, it's a hidden halo, and there's a reason for that. Had Botticelli come out and put a halo on a pagan goddess, well, that wouldn't have ended well. So instead, he hides it, and he uses the opening in the trees to create the sense of a halo without making it too obvious. To Venus's right are the three graces, perhaps to remind the wife of her honor-bound role in the home, to be charming, to be beautiful, and to be creative, amongst other roles. Charming to guess, beautiful for the husband, and creative in her pursuits like needlework and other acceptable things of the time. Remember, we're in the 15th century. Moving to the far right, we see the blue Zephyrus, the west wind of winter, is about to carry off and marry Chloris, who is a goddess of kind of false spring. Imagine that day in February or January when it gets to 50 or 60, everyone kind of gets a little loopy. They start wearing shorts and everything. Everyone goes, yeah, it's going to be spring soon, and then it's 20 below the next week. Maybe that's just Wisconsin. But that's kind of what we're seeing here from Chloris. She will be transformed through their marriage into Flora, the goddess of spring. In the center, we see Cupid. Now, that's kind of interesting. Why is Cupid there? Cupid is there because this is an arranged marriage. Really, any marriage in the Western world, unless you were poor, and I mean poor, poor, working class still arranged. All other marriages are arranged, and they're arranged by your family. It's so that if you have a little bit of land and they have a little bit of land, you can put it together, and eventually over generations you can have maybe a lot of land. Of course, this doesn't always work out, but it's the idea. Almost all marriages, until we get into the end of the 19th century, are going to be arranged, especially in the middle and upper classes. So Cupid is there to bring hope that these two will find love, because more than likely, they haven't actually met before they meet, well, possibly under the painting, if you catch my meaning. And then at the far left, we see Mercury reaching up with his staff to clear the storm clouds of a poor or stormy marriage. The idea being, of course, these two haven't met, they don't know anything about each other, so they're going to have a lot of work to do. And this seems like anathema to us, this idea of an arranged marriage, but to them it would have made perfect sense. After all, what 18-year-old really knows what they need in a marriage or in a partner. That's why we date. That's why things happen in the 21st century. But at the time, it was felt the parents knew best. And I mean, just think about that for a minute. Who would your parents pick as your significant other? But getting past that, let's look at the piece as a whole. And we see those different elements coming together. And if you read it as a wedding painting, Zephyrus and Chloris becoming married is basically an allusion to the wife needing to make herself available to the husband. If she does, there will be fertility, just like in the spring. The 
entire thing is being watched over by this goddess of fertility. So in other words, go out and have children. The Grace is again talking directly to the wife, telling her what to do. You'll notice there's nothing here talking to the husband. The idea was that the husband would be, well, let's call it worldly. You can't see my air quotes, but worldly. And the wife would be, again, air quotes, innocent. But let me point something out to you. When you look at the histories of the time, journals and diaries and letters, you will notice that women at the time were no more innocent than what we see amongst teenagers in the 20th and 21st century. The only difference is sexting by carrier pigeon would have been really difficult. But you get the idea. Women were supposed to be innocent, but they probably weren't that innocent. We see lots and lots of ways of tricking husbands and tricking in-laws into believing uh, that their new uh, daughter-in-law is going to be innocent. Mercury under this reading is, of course, clearing those storm clouds, acting as a beneficent force. Everyone is hoping that these two will stay together, but in reality, what frequently happens is the husband will eventually take a lover and the wife will take a lover. And as long as they don't get caught, I'm sorry, I misspoke. As long as the wife doesn't get caught, then it's fine. If she does, then her penalty is considerably worse than his. And it comes down to the city state, everything from uh, being publicly humiliated to, in some cases, being put to death. So, kind of a tricky situation. From a wedding perspective, all of the flowers that you see them standing around, again, speak to fertility and willingness to be available to the husband so that this marriage can produce children. And by children, I mean heirs. And by heirs, I mean people who can be important later on. So you get the idea. This is all a really odd situation when it comes to love. But this, this piece is all about really it acts as an instruction manual to the wife. These are the things you're supposed to do. These are the things you're supposed to look out for. And it's up to you to make a happy marriage. The male is nowhere in sight. <laughs> 